Well, Matthew 10, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 10. It's good to see you this morning. Hope your week was good, well, whatever you want to say. I don't know the proper adverb, adjective, I'm not sure. I don't write the English, I just use it. <clears throat> Sometimes not so great. So Matthew chapter 10, if you would. Well, happy August. Happy dog days. I pray your heart's in tune with Jesus, even if the heat's turning up, as it is. It is. The rain gives us a nice respite. But it's a busy season of life for many schools starting this week, and some already started last week. But fall is around the corner, and a number of folks are building, buying, and bustling about. And in all of this, I want to encourage you to let Jesus be your center to let him be your heartbeat, to let him be your daily bread, to let his people be your comfort zone, to let his work be your passion in life. We're going to talk about his work today and the gospel work that is. We're going to try to do so simply because he talked about it simply in simple terms. We saw how last week how he planned to help the weak and the wandering world, and he did a lot of traveling to all kinds of different places. He could have sang in regards to Galilee, I've been everywhere, man, I'm sure he could. Um, but he didn't go as a sightseer because he went and he preached and he healed. He told the truth about the kingdom that was to come and he touched people's lives and his message and his mercy pointed people to the kingdom, pointed people to God and his heart broke for them because they were as sheep without a shepherd. They were like a great harvest that was ripe, but it was on the verge of spoiling because it didn't have anybody to come and guide them. And so he empowered ordinary men, thank God for that, to do an extraordinary work. And he sent his 12 apostles to his people Israel. So let's read about it, refresh your memory a little bit. If you'll look in chapter 10, we're going to pick up in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying... Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the Samaritans enter ye not, into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus was specific. He came to them, to Israel first. And as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, all the work that he did. You do it. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. You think, why did these men have purses? Well, we try to cover that. Nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes nor yet staves. For the workmen... Same as laborer in verse 37, 38. The workman is worthy of his meat. The gospel work is the last great free enterprise. But it's not free for even a gospel preacher to eat. So this morning we're going to consider this. What finances gospel work? What finances gospel work? Work. I'm going to ask Brother Tommy Hawk if you would pray and ask God to bless this message this morning. Thank you, brother. 
No, I didn't have Luke go get this for me so I could drink it up here. But it's an amazing thing how refreshing an ice-cold Coca-Cola can be. Um, I'm not even a big fan of Coke. I like Dr. Pepper. Amen? All right. But during dog days, it's kind of nice to match up your mugginess in life with an ice-cold soda pop, or however you say it. Right. And uh, with northerners and southerners here, I know that what it might be called can be as different as the day is long. And we like to refresh ourselves with things like a Coke, whether it's because we feel like we're drinking it with polar bears. Some of you will get that. Or Santa Claus, okay? You take a drink and ah, life is good. And you feel refreshed. Coca-Cola has been very successful at refreshing folks around the world. I'm going to read a little snippet from an article. It says, from Boston to Beijing, from Montreal to Moscow, Coca-Cola, more than any other consumer product, has brought pleasure to thirsty consumers around the globe. For 125 years, they have created a special moment of pleasure for hundreds of millions of people every day. Now, whatever the company is today, because there's different comments about it, someone might say Coca-Cola or something like that. I understand that. Coca-Cola would not be anything they are without Mr. Anonymous. You say, who's that? Mr. Robert W. Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff became the president of Coca-Cola in the 20s, and he guided the company as president for 60-plus years, and they flourished under his visionary leadership. And he had high standards of quality and, and service, and even through the Great Depression, he came on board before that time, and even through the Great Depression, they believed everyone has a nickel and can be refreshed with a Coke. And on... On through that time, Coke became a household name in America, and, and it didn't stop there because by the 30s, they were popping up bottling warehouses around the world, and, and here it went, it took off, and Woodruff's vision was to put Coca-Cola within an arm's reach of desire. Someone wants it, we're going to get it to them. His thought was, we have the Coke, and they have the desire, and so if you today want to be refreshed by a Coke, you can why? Because a man made it his passion to connect Coke with desire for people all over the world. And Coca-Cola refreshes the world one Coke at a time. That's still their mission today. How many people all over the world need to be refreshed not by a Coke, but by their creator? How many people know his real love? How many people have his real hope? How many people feel his gentle hand? How many people hear his sweet voice? The world lies in wickedness, but many do desire better than that what they have, and many desire to be refreshed with Jesus' living water, and Jesus knows this. And he cares deeply about getting it done. And as visionary as President Woodruff was, or Mr. Woodruff was, Jesus had vision down first. You see, Jesus' passion was to connect Christ with their desire. And thus he did his ministry in Galilee. And although the, the po politicians of the day and the religious leadership of the day could care less about the common man, Jesus went right to the common man and met them where they were and connected his living water with the very desires of their soul. And he didn't let it stop there because he couldn't reach everybody by himself. And so he gave his power to do what he had been doing to the apostles and he sent them to do his work in Israel. And he worked laboriously. He worked to see the kingdom of God grow and he wanted to gather people together into his love and grace. And Jesus of Nazareth became a household name in Israel. But it didn't stop there because he sent his disciples, as we will see, and as we talk about regularly, he sent his disciples into all the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Make disciples of all nations. Why? So that those people could follow Jesus too. And why do that? Well, he wouldn't be on earth forever. And his followers knew his forgiveness and grace. His followers, these men, now had 
God as their father and they would practically represent him worldwide. And so Jesus' passion to, was to refresh the world one Christian at a time. One Christian at a time. Woodruff's vision was to put Coca-Cola within, in, within an arm's reach of desire. But Jesus' vision is to put a disciple within an arm's reach of need. The world needs Jesus, so the world needs disciples desperately. And it's Jesus' vision and his passion to put a disciple within an arm's reach of an individual's need. You know why? Because if someone in the world knows a disciple, they have an opportunity to know Jesus. If someone in the world knows a disciple, they have an opportunity to be refreshed by living water that will never be quenched. And you know what happened from here? Bottling plants went all over the world. You say, what's a disciple bottling plant? A local church. You read the book of Acts and you see how the disciples spread the gospel and how local churches sprang up all over the world and, and it allowed people, men and women and women and boys and girls of all ages, of all backgrounds, to get a cool, refreshing drink, to be truly refreshed. It allowed that to happen. And this is the last great free enterprise gospel work. We have the greatest visionary, Jesus Christ. We have the greatest strategy of just making disciples, just a simple one-on-one -on -one thing. And we have the greatest team, the Holy Spirit of God himself and local churches. We can and we will refresh the world, make a difference, one disciple at a time. So what is gospel work for us? What's gospel work for Emmanuel Baptist Church? It's this, just simply seeing his vision happen here. Not my vision, not your vision, his vision. We want to connect Christ and desire for people all over the world. We want to make disciples of all nations and of every generation, no matter the age, no matter the cultural background, that doesn't matter, make disciples. And how do we go about that? We often talk about gathering and growing and going. And I just want you to think about this for a minute because I want you to understand how significant this, this process plays in your life. That as you gather as a disciple, you know what really that's about as we gather as the church and as we listen to Jesus' word and as we worship Jesus together, you know what that does? It refreshes you. Because that refreshing, refreshing living water, that refreshment of Jesus and His love, it fills your cup. It's like tossing you a cold glass bottle, which by the way, glass bottles are better than cans anyways, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot different. And that's what, that's what Jesus is. He's refreshing to you. And when you come to hear His Word and when you come and worship Him and your cup is filled, it fills you with the love of Jesus and it refreshes you. What, what about growing as a disciple? What's the big deal about growing as a disciple? What's the big deal about spending time with other disciples and maybe going to a disciple fellowship or going to a ladies fellowship or hanging out with some other men or just getting together, not just to, you know, let's just, let's just hang out, you know, a little bit or whatever, but let's get together and let's actually talk about about Jesus. Let's share what's going on in our life. Let's pray for one another. Let, like, let's pray, like right now, while we're together, guys. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, let's do it. What, what's the big deal about that? Well, as you fellowship with other believers and as you fellowship with other disciples, you know what that does? It refreshes us. It stirs us up. It connects our hearts. Christ is in me. Christ is in you. And when we're talking about Christ together, and when we're praying together, it connects us and brings us together in ways that you just can't replicate. And so what is this going with the gospel? What's that all about? Well, it's about, it's about, here's the love of Jesus that's refreshed me. Here's us loving each other that has refreshed us. Now we can go and love the world with that same love and refresh them. And so gospel work at Emmanuel Baptist Church means that disciples that are going through this process are going back out into the world just lit up with love. And they take that love and they love other people so they can refresh that person and that person and that person and that person and that person. We send disciples around our area locally to see people get a cool, refreshing taste of Jesus. Just like this young mom, 19-year-old mom I read in an article this past week, shared with a few of you, who, who was arrested because she was guilty of killing her 10-month-old baby. She fell asleep in the bathtub. and She was strung out on drugs. And she had the 10-month-old with her and she fell asleep and the baby drowned. And her mother was also arrested. 
36 years old, possession of narcotics, five children in that home taken into custody. This is in our own backyard. These people need to be refreshed. And Jesus has called us to be refreshed so we can go refresh. And, and it's not just seeing a, someone, because imagine seeing someone like that come to know Jesus. It's not just seeing someone like that come to know Jesus. That would be fantastic. But listen, all across our state, churches are dying and closing their doors. And you know what we need? We need more of what's going on at Emmanuel Baptist Church all over this state. We need more bottling plants who are bottling up Jesus' love in a disciple and sending that out into their community to get Jesus to people all over the state. And you know what we need around the world? I mean, we could just continue to expand this out. This is why we support missionaries. We believe that we need to send disciples and i.e. missionaries to go around the world and to take the love of Jesus and to see people saved and to see pastors lead those churches so they can be bottling plants worldwide. Listen, Jesus has been in this business this a lot longer than we have and we're coming online with him and we're on his program here in the 21st century not ours and our purpose here is to fulfill his vision and do this work and commit ourselves to this so that more people around the world can be refreshed so that those little orphan boys and orphan girls who have nobody in the jungles of Africa can be taken the love of Jesus by a faithful church that was started by a faithful miss missionary that faithful mature disciples of Jesus all the way in America supported on a regular basis. So I want to ask you, are you given to gospel work? Are you given to the process of gathering as a church, growing as disciples, and going as a gospel servant? We, don't, we are very intentional and purposeful about what we do because we want to see you be everything Jesus wants you to be. Are you given to that in your life? Jesus is clear, if I'm not everything to you, I'm nothing. Look in verse 38. He said, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you're not willing to die, you don't deserve to call yourself my disciple. If you're not willing to die to everything that is you and pick up your cross and follow me, you do not deserve to call yourself a disciple. And so let me ask you, is Jesus everything to you? Is his work everything? Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Do you want your life to glorify the Father? Do you want him to change you from the inside out? As he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Will you let go of this world for the one to come? Will you let go of your comforts and your obligations so you can follow Jesus? Are you given to gospel work? Are you are you refreshing? This is, if you were to open this Coke right here, it would not be very refreshing. Elizabeth has had this in our fridge for like five years. <laughs> Long story, you ask her. <laughs> she actually got it at, here at the uh, world of Coca-Cola. Listen, we want to bottle you up with Jesus, but you choose whether or not you're going to go out of here and refresh someone right away, or if you're going to go flat. You choose whether or not your life is going to sit on a shelf in a refrigerator, and you're comfortable, you're comfortable and you're cool, or if you are going to provide a cool, refreshing drink to someone else in this county. That's your decision. And if you are not willing to give Jesus your everything, Jesus said to these guys, unreservedly follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We can make excuses. And listen, this is me too. We can make excuses as, as, as long as we want to. As far as, well, this is why I'm not fishing for men and this is why I'm going in this fear and this is how the culture is. We can do all that we want to. But the reality is, if we are all in with Jesus and we are committed to this process and you say, Jesus, I want to be bottled up and I want to be refreshing to somebody if we are committed to Jesus he said you give everything to me I'm going to pour my life into you and I will use you to refresh somebody else that's the bottom line are you given to gospel work 
Jesus desires that you freely give you to him and his work. Now, he expected that of his apostles first. Look at verse 7 and 8. He told them to go preach. I mean, just tell the truth about the kingdom of heaven that was coming, that was at hand right there. The king was there. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. This would prove to the world that the kingdom was there and Jesus was, in fact, the king. He was, in fact, the Messiah. And then he said this. He said, freely ye have received, freely give. In other words, you didn't do anything to get my truth or the ability to touch lives. You didn't buy it from me. You can't buy it. You didn't buy it. Freely you have received, so freely give. So don't charge anything to others for this ministry. In those days, there were exorcists and others who would cast out demons, and there were, there, or they would try to cast out demons, and there were different kinds of doctors. But the common denominator for all of them, they would charge people to help them. They would charge people to be of service to them. It's, it's like the many today who go to a psychiatrist or who go to a psychologist or go to a doctor. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing the medical profession. I'm just saying in those days there were many people who in the name of helping someone else, they would charge a pretty penny. But a lot of people, there were still a lot of problem, problems as this evidence by Jesus going and solving all these problems. But that's the way it was. Later in the New Testament, False teachers would charge money. They'd say, oh yeah, I'll come teach you the way, but I need to, you know, talk to me. And that's why you have the expectations, the qualifications of an elder, where an elder wasn't to be in it for filthy lucre. A pastor wasn't to be in it for money. He wasn't to be in it for gain. Jesus didn't charge anyone anything for his ministry, and he didn't want his apostles to do it either. Think about this. I mean, the apostles had Jesus' power to heal everybody. Think about the money they could have made. Yeah, you got a dead son? Oh, that's going to cost this much. But Jesus said, don't do that. Freely you have received, freely give. The gospel of Jesus Christ is free to all. Christ can't be bought like a Coke. It can only be received as the king that he is and his apostles were to spread his kingly message. Now, stop and think about this, the apostles Stop and think about what might have been running through their heads. Because if we can't charge anything for this, I mean, how are we going to make a living? I mean, you told us to leave our nets. I mean, we're not fishing anymore. Matthew's not collecting taxes anymore. How are we going to make a living? I mean, and, and think about this too. He went everywhere. Our tires are about to get some miles. I'm doing the math. I don't have enough sandals. And these are going to wear out. I'm going to have holes in them. They've got a hole in them as they are. I'm a cheap fisherman. I'm going to need some help. We're going to need some extra supplies. We've got to eat too. Well, Jesus addressed that. Verse 9 and 10, he said, don't take extra gold, silver, brass. Don't take these metals. Or they were either monies or metals that could be exchanged for monies. And don't take them in your purses. Just been a man bag, all right? A belt. Uh, it would have been like a girdle uh, that they would have had. And it would have been hollow. It would have been like some kind of a, I don't know, I picture kind of a sash or something around their waist that would tighten things down as a belt and, uh, or a girdle that they could put their money in. And he's saying, don't, don't go raid the savings jar back home and fill up your, your purse with the, that money, and, and don't even, um, let's see, where am I? Uh, verse 10, don't, don't provide a script. That would have been like a backpack. It would have been like a leather pouch or something. They could put food in or money. Hey, don't take script for your journey. Don't take two coats. If you have one outer garment right now, don't go grab another one. You say, well, why would you want to be wear, walking around wearing two coats? Well, for them to travel, oftentimes they probably slept out in the wild. So that a second coat would act like a blanket. But Jesus said, don't go back and grab yourself another coat. Don't go grabbing some sandals. Don't go grabbing even a staff. Take what you have with you and go. And go do the work that I've called you to do. They were embarking on the greatest campaign ever, but there was no campaign funding or special equipment needed. Jesus said, just go as I sent you. Now, I want to note a couple things here, okay? We've got to do a little homework together about these instructions for the apostles. We do not have apostles today like we mentioned last week. Also, these instructions weren't forever because if you were to go and read, you can write this down and check it out later, but if you go to read Luke 22, verse 35 and forward, Jesus basically asked them, hey, guys, when I sent you out with all these things, did you lack anything? Well, they said no. 
He said, well, now if you have these things, take them. And if you don't have a sword, go buy one. And so this was a tem- temporary instruction for them. They were on an important mission and they need to focus on that mission. This was a temporary deal. Now, notice this too. These instructions were not for asceticism. You say, what in the world is asceticism? It's basically this. You forget earthly things for spiritual purposes. You shave your head like Mr. Robert here. Get a robe. Okay, you, you look good. Okay, you get, a, you get a robe. You become a monk. Asceticism. You minimize everything in your life. And go out to some monastery somewhere. That's asceticism. Jesus wasn't telling them to go be an an ascetic. In fact, if that was it, then we'll just sell the property and go meet in the woods. We don't need anything else. But we're not going to do that. Because that's not what Jesus was saying here. We use the things of this world, but we don't abuse them. The apostles were not to go make extra preparations. They needed to focus on their mission and keep first things first. Now, folks, we need to focus on our mission and keep first things first. One man said, a church whose members are preoccupied with material concerns still finds it hard to convince the world that it should take God seriously. If we're busy bickering and fighting over interior decorations and the color of chairs and such like, the world's not well going to believe that Jesus loves you, this I know. Are they? Teamwork will make this dream work. Come on. It will. Jesus was not commanding them to forget earthly needs. He was commanding them to focus on heavenly goals. Now imagine their response. Um, Well, how are we going to eat? Why shouldn't we take extra preparation? Why shouldn't we make extra provision? What is going to finance this gospel work? Well, Jesus gave a very simple answer at the end of verse 10. He said, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Remember what Paul said? If you don't work, you don't what? Well, here Jesus said, if you do work, you eat. The workman is worthy of his meat. The laborers I send will be fed. Well, how would they be fed? Jesus already taught them about God's provision. Remember back, we read it. Matthew chapter 6. He said, your father knows what things you have need. Seek first the kingdom of God and God is going to provide all these things that you need. But how would he provide? Though, look at verse 11. They were going to go to specific people in Israel, the hospitable Israel, into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go hence. So if they went to a house, generally Israel was very hospitable in those days, and it was the real deal, and it was especially expected for people to take care of traveling rabbis. And so Jesus was sending them right into the right context. They went to those people, whatever people received them and received their message, though that's where they would stay, and that's where God would take care of them. That means they come into a town, and they come to the first house, and the first person that welcomed them is Pretty, pretty poor and they go and start doing ministry in the city and they run into someone who's, who's friendly to them and they got a little more wealth Jesus said hey don't go over there you stay who first received you and stay in that house until you go and I will meet your needs there I'm going to take care of you he said and so basically Jesus said freely do my work without packing extra because the work you do will take care of you how would their needs be met the people they met. You see, gospel work is people. And when people get saved, people begin to follow Jesus and people would take care of the gospel workers' needs. The receivers of their message would be the ones who would give to their needs. And then wasn't this the case down the road? I mean, think about it. Early church had all things common, they met needs. You have churches, different churches throughout the New Testament that met Paul's needs from time to time. You have Paul's teaching to local churches where they were to take care of their pastor, their flock, 1 Corinthians 9.14. Paul reminded the church of Corinthian, uh, the church in Corinth, that the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul told the people there that those, that those that are taught are to take care of those that teach in all good things. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, you have let, let the elders who rule well be w- counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And he said, you would don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The laborer is worthy of his reward. So gospel preachers who do gospel work, what happens then? People follow Jesus. 
And the people that follow Jesus take care of gospel workers. That's how it happens here. That's how it happens at most churches across this land. And the people who take care of gospel workers are the people who are taking care of gospel work. Now let me ask you, are you refreshed by Emmanuel Baptist Church? Do you enjoy the work God is doing here? Are you helped by the word and the worship of Jesus? Do you enjoy getting to know other disciples at Emmanuel Baptist Church? Do you want to see the world refreshed by Jesus? Do you want to be given to the gospel work here? Well, listen, hear me. Someone supports a pastor to oversee the gospel work here. Someone supports a property to enjoy where it's done, to take care of us. Someone supports a ministry to increase what work we do. Someone supports Emmanuel Baptist Church so gather and grow and go happen. Someone gives a dollar so a disciple can grow at Emmanuel. What finances gospel work? People do. Disciples do. And I'm looking at them. So what finances it? It's the work itself. Are you freely giving the gospel work? Where is your heart? Earth or heaven? You see, Jesus said, an indicator of where your heart is is where you put your treasure. Where is your heart? Who are you serving? Self or Savior? What are you living for? The American dream or the kingdom vision? The dream will dissipate, but the vision is around. You say, but if I start giving, but what about my needs? Well, if you're not giving, what about your heart? You say, but I, I'm too poor to give even 10%. Well, Paul talked about these Macedonian disciples who first gave their own hearts. The point is that your heart be given to the Lord, and then they gave to the needs that came up. But Jesus first had their hearts before he had anything else. And if he has your heart, he likely will have everything else. You can use the American dream to advance the gospel. You can use your abundance to advance the gospel. You can make your heart and your life and your all about advancing the gospel. Well, you say, well, what takes care of needs? What, what, what's going to help with that? Well, what takes care of your needs greater than anything? Matthew 6.33, when you decide, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's why we've been practically given the last four vehicles. We believe God is a car lot because a long time ago, we decided to do something to prioritize gospel work with our finances. That, let me ask you this. Why have our air conditioning units outlived themselves here at Emmanuel Baptist Church? Perhaps it has something to do with over $99,000 plus given to gospel work to missionaries in 2020. That's what it has to do with. And perhaps as long as Emmanuel Baptist Church is outward focused with the gospel, God will provide every single need we have and more. Through the grace of our God and the generosity of our people, we will forward Jesus' vision around the world and get a disciple within an arm's reach of need. Now let me ask you, are you freely given to gospel work? Is this your life? Is this what you're all about? If Jesus has refreshed you, why not give yourself to refresh one more? Give yourself to gospel work. Give yourself to being a disciple who makes disciples. Let's refresh the world one disciple at a time. Now I want to ask you, we're going to take some time just to pray. Miss Evelyn, if you'd come, and she's going to play softly. And as we have... And Jesus wants us to pray. And so as a people, we're going to just have a time where you can pray. And I want to ask you to pray this, that every disciple of Jesus at Emmanuel Baptist Church will be given to gospel work, that this will be our life, and that every disciple of Jesus will, as they are able, and of their own heart, be giving to gospel work. Pray that God will help us go with the gospel and refresh one more.